And I will uh, introduce today's speaker then. Um, so we're super lucky to have uh, Point Blue's own uh, Dr. Jay Roberts join us. Dr. Roberts is a quantitative ecologist with the Sierra Group, Sierra Nevada Group at Point Blue. Um, and much of his work focuses on creating uh, robust metrics of bird abundance and distribution to help track uh, the ecological effects of climate change, land management, fire, and, and the like. And so Dr. Roberts, um, uh, he received his master's in environmental science and policy from the University of Wisconsin in Green Bay and his doctorate in fisheries and wildlife from Michigan State University. And today he'll be talking with us about his work on balancing forest disturbances for biodiversity um, in the Sierra Nevada. So Dr. Roberts, thanks so much for joining us today. We're really glad for the opportunity to hear about your work and, um, and go ahead and take it away. Thanks, Chelsea. And again, thank you for organizing this seminar series. It's really useful. It's really timely. It's really uh, great to get everybody together to talk about this stuff. And to start, um, I'm going to say apologies for uh, technical difficulties and also apologies for some of these slides not being quite as visually uh, pretty as they, they could be. I kind of ran out of time for preparing this because my daughter ended up in the hospital to get her appendix removed earlier this week. And so I've been a little bit distracted. <laughs> Didn't have quite enough, as much time as I wanted to, to uh, put some of this stuff together. But I think we still have a good um, story to tell here and we still have lots of interesting things to look at. So uh, I'm gonna start going here. Um, in the Sierra Nevada, uh, our, this seminar series is not just about Sierra Nevada, right? It's California focused primarily, but um, the, uh, the studies that I'm going to talk about and the ecology that I'm going to talk about is all centered on Sierra Nevada uh, biology. So in this uh, region, fire has been, always been a major influence on habitat and ecological function. And that fire has been suppressed for such a long time that we're in a sort of state of affairs here in this region where that where the, the forest is, is basically starved. I mean, that's kind of an anthropogenic term to say that uh, a region or a landscape can be starved of a process like fire, but that's, I think, probably a pretty accurate way to describe it. Uh, other influences here, of course, are things like climate change. And in that picture on the left with the dead trees from, uh, from a high vantage point, uh, I imagine most of you are familiar with this uh, phenomenon where the beetles, mountain and western pine beetles, had have uh, out, had a really massive outbreak in the southern Sierra Nevada and killed uh, un over 100 million, 150 million-ish trees in that part of the Sierra Nevada. That's because the trees did not have enough water to um, to produce the their defenses, which is to eject sap and pitch and keep the beetles out. So there's there's all these different conflicting sometimes overlapping stresses on, on the Sierra Nevada system. And we wanted to know, or I wanted to describe what those effects are for wildlife and specifically birds. Birds are really good indicators of wildlife. So we have lots of results that I think are um, applicable to uh, more broadly to speak about uh, ecology and ecological function in the region. Um, okay, uh, Libby, go ahead and next slide. So the, um, there's a couple of videos here that I'm gonna have you click on in a second, but, but not quite yet, okay? Um, historically, lots of area burned in the Sierra Nevada. There's different ways to come up with these numbers, but something on the order of 500,000 acres or so burned every year across a landscape of, depending on how you define the boundaries, 10 to 15 million acres. So given that, that, frequent, that frequency in that area per year burned, the return interval for, for fire in most of these habitats historically it was quite short, something on the order of 20 years, depending on elevation and habitat type and so on. And it's really hard to sort of, uh, picture how that works. So the the video on the left, Libby, why don't you click on that? I'm not sure if the sound is going to play, but I hope it does. Okay, I'm going to try. <laughs> 
So this is a this is a map that was developed by Esri, and you can see the the little yellow um, specks that show up. Those are fires burning in in each year. And Libby, if you can pause it just for a second. All right. So where are we at? We're at 1932. It it uh, focuses on a couple of individual fires. Mataliha fire, 200,000 acres. So it's going to uh, point out some of these larger ones. And so basically what it's showing is the accumulation of burned area over time. And it started in 1910, it's gonna go all the way through 2019. And try to, um, try to pay attention to like where these fires are occurring and especially in the Sierra Nevada. Go ahead and play it again. There we go. It's not playing sound as far as I can hear, but um, just picture like some really dramatic kind of movie tense music playing. That's that's what you would hear. In southern the southern coast of uh, California is experiencing quite a bit of fire, um, whereas we're in 1960s here and still most of the Sierra does not have any very much orange in it at least. And as time goes on, a lot of the, the southern coast of California kind of is filling up with. Uh, orange reflecting the burn uh, frequency. So now we're in the 1990s. Libby, you want to pause it one more time for me, please? 2003, looks like it got paused on. So per year, there's acres burned. Uh, in certain years across California, those the number of acres can be pretty high. But still, we're in this, this period of time in the Sierras where not much has burned over the last uh, you know, 90 years or so. And so over those 90 years, fire, the fires that do start were pretty actively suppressed. Um, go ahead and play it just for a little bit longer. So, now in these more recent years, 2010, 13, there's rim fire. We end up with a few larger patches. Um, you can pause it again. This is basically the end of the video. So there's some larger patches. There's some accumulated orange area, but the vast majority of that region is, is not colored in, right? So the vast majority of the Sierras has, has not burned at all in the last 100 years or so. And keep in mind, this is an area that typically burned uh, on the order of every 20 or 30 years for most of these habitats. So there's a huge, huge deficit in, in burned area. Um, I think we'll skip the next video because it's Malcolm North talking about what the solution to this is. The solution that I think is, is the consensus among uh, fire scientists and land managers in California is to re, um, is to get more fire back on the landscape as part of uh, our management strategies. So you'll hear people describe the situation as um, you know, embracing more fire, allowing fire to burn, restoring fire to the landscape. And the reason we need that is because the capacity for us to actively manage with mechanical treatments or fuels treatments or logging is so much smaller than the amount of area that needs to be um, treated every year that it's just not possible for people to manage this landscape in such a way that we can account for the deficit of fire. Okay, uh, let me go ahead to the next slide. So the, the situation that fire creates is a successional process. So on the left, the initial conditions look like that in a lot of places in this area where you have lots of small trees, lots of seedlings, very dense, some larger trees, um, but overall lots of fuel in vertical strata so that when fires happen, they can spread into the canopy. And if they do that, that becomes by definition high severity fire. So the oral restore is removed, shrubs grow in underneath. And then in this paper, um, they were exploring what the effects of reburning are. And in some cases, if you reburn with high severity several times, you may end up in a state where 
um, there's shrub cover, shrub or chaparral cover that tends to not transition back into forest very quickly. In other situations where it burns at lower severity, you may burn uh, lower fuels and ground vegetation, of course, and leave overstory trees and larger trees intact. And so the point I want to make with this, this figure, this diagram, is that a, a variety of outcomes of fire are possible. And given that there's a deficit of fire on the landscape um, that we just witnessed, there's, there's far more habitat in that initial condition than, than the way most of the plant and wildlife species evolved with in this region, right? So we wanna explore what, what the influences of fire are on some of these species so we can better understand how to um, manage for conserving biodiversity and manage for ecological resilience in the Sierras. Okay, Libby, you can go to the next slide for me. And there's been some recent work on this by uh, many scientists. And there's, some, there's an interesting theme, I think, that comes out across all these studies. And, and that is that high severity fire is not always a bad thing. So in, in a lot, for a lot of species, there are a lot of species that depend on high severity fire for creating habitat. And many of these studies recently have been pointing that out, that uh, avian community, biodiversity in general, tend to benefit from these high severity fires. And it's been a little bit hard, I think, um, for all of us to sort of wrap our heads around this idea that high severity fire can be a good thing for ecology. Um, certainly with Smokey the Bear in existence for many decades in the, the middle of the um, 20th century, kind of shaped our understanding of fire to be um, so to be a little more uh, skeptical of its benefits and to be more afraid of the um, dangers and destruction and so on. There's lots of these loaded terminologies, terminology to describe when fires happen. But for wildlife and for plants and for ecology, um, that's not really necessary. It's not really um, useful to focus on that. And so when I, when I say, that fire can be a, a positive for biodiversity. I don't want anyone to think that I'm um, promoting the idea that wildfires are always great in that when you know, things like the Paradise Fire happen, that's a good thing for ecology. Um, human safety, human um, health and uh, property loss are always um, very important and will always be more important than, than our goals for managing, but we still need to find a way to, to mesh those two things. So for the rest of this, I'm going, going to really just focus on what the effects of fire are for uh, birds and biodiversity. Okay, so uh, uh, Libby, go ahead to the next slide. So quite a bit of our research in the Sierra group at Point Blue has been targeted at some questions like the following. Uh, which species, for example, rely on fire for habitat? Um, like what, are the, what are the implications of fire for habitat? How do we track it over time? What portion of the bird community and so on are adapted to different types of fire and different uh, distributions of fire? And so I grouped some of these, these questions um, into five different topics and I'll, I'll show you is some results from some of our recent work that kind of elucidate each of these five different things. Um, so the first two that I'll show you is, is first that we find that a high severity fire, in particular high severity fire where the canopy trees are burned, supports a really unique component of the bird community, including many relatively rare species. And then secondly, that those influences, not just of high severity, but high and low and all sorts of other things, last for quite a while. They last for decades following the fire. All right, and then I'll move on after this, after showing you some of those results to things like um, uh, nailing down the, the exact combinations of fire severity and time for particular species to show you like a, a, the mechanism of how we can end up with portions of the community that are adapted to fire versus other, or high severity fire versus low severity versus other forms of disturbance. And then 
uh, we'll add the spatial component to it and talk about something called uh, um, that's referred to typically as pyrodiversity, which is just variation in fire severity over space. And then I'll finish with comparisons with other forms of tree mortality, in particular those uh, the beetle mortality on conifer trees in the Southern Sierra. And then we'll talk about managing post-fire habitats and pre-fire habitats before we wrap it all up. Okay, so Libby, go ahead to the next slide. So we just got a paper published recently that compares sort of on equal footing. Like the, the whole idea here was to look at what the effects of different types of disturbances are over time on the entire bird community or as much as of the bird community as we could assemble. And so for this analysis, we used something like 2000 different locations that we have been sampling for over 10 years all the way across the Sierra Nevada. So it's a long-term data set, it's a large data set. It's really unique and useful in that um, it is a, a random representative sample of basically the entire actively managed forest within the Sierra Nevada region on forest service property, not private land. And so because we have this large data set, we are able to um, look at what the influences on bird abundance and diversity are from different types of fire. For example, in that left panel, you'll see there's some acronyms there. Uh, the gray circles are LSF, low severity fire. Orange triangles are moderate and high severity fire, MHSF. The blue um, squares are mechanical treatments. So that's basically your, your standard fuels treatments in logging. And then the UD, UO, and US are all undisturbed forest. Okay, so undisturbed dense forest is UD. Undisturbed open forest, which is lower tree cover, and higher shrub cover. And then there's undisturbed shrub, which is very low tree cover and rather high shrub cover. And so one way that we thought of to show how these different disturbances can compare in terms of their effect on the, the bird community is by looking at diversity. Um, and you'll see that those orange triangles, that's moderate and high severity fire, across a long time period has uh, basically the highest diversity of any of these, these disturbance types. And keep in mind that these disturbances create relatively consistent habitat conditions following the disturbance, right? Um, the three undisturbed types, of the three undisturbed types, the shrub habitat, US, has the highest diversity. The other two are among the lowest, dense forest and open forest. Right? And I think if you asked a lot of scientists what they would predict for undisturbed forest bird diversity versus post-fire or post-managed forest, they might come up with a different answer than this. But this is what we found. And interestingly, these effects, um, the higher, relatively higher diversity in moderate and high severity fire lasts for at least 13 or 14 or 15 years relative to these other habitat types. So these, these disturbances create situations where there's a lasting legacy for, for quite some time. And if we had more data and we had you know, better records going back through time, we might be able to extend this time range to you know, 30 or 40 or 50 years, but those data don't really exist. The maps that we use to establish which locations were burned and at what severity and which locations were treated, they kind of just stop around 1990 or a little earlier than that. So, this is what we're left with. Another way to describe what the effect is on the bird community is to look at dissimilarity. So these, these diversity um, metric does not really incorporate which species are present. It's just a measure of how many species are present and what are their relative abundances, right? So dissimilarity takes into account which species are actually there. And in, in this figure on the top right, it's showing these pairwise comparisons of different um, age brackets of the disturbances. So moderate high severity from two to six years is that first little blob and then seven to 12 years and 13 to 19 years are the next couple. And it does similar things for low severity fire from two to 19 years and mechanical treatment from two to 19 years. And then the three undisturbed types 
are not um, time sensitive. So they're their own little brackets. And each one of those dots in there is a comparison of the, the community, the species and their uh, abundances to each other, um, each other category. So each dot there is one pairwise comparison across all these different, these different groups. And you can see that the three blobs on the left for modern high severity fire are, the, are among the three highest. And by quite a um, significant amount, the most unique bird community is in moderate and high severity fire from 13 to 19 years following the fire. So we interpret this as an indication that uh, moderate and high severity fire are providing habitat for a unique portion of the community. So these species, they tend to be rare. Um, they tend to be rather important conservation wise because of their rarity. And because of the rarity of modern high severity fire on the landscape, um, I think you can use this maybe to justify uh, uh, using some management techniques to, to promote those habitats. Okay, so um, yeah, so this, this paper is just published and this sort of begs a, a different question. Like, why are some species more likely to be found in modern high severity habitat at a certain number of years following the fire? So Libby, you can go ahead and to the next slide. And there are certain ways that we, we try to parse out these different patterns. My slide hasn't changed yet. There you go. Um, so there's the third topic here that many bird species are adapted to very particular combinations of fire severity and time. And so um, Richard Hutto, Dr. Hutto from Montana, he has studied fire for a long time and, and bird um, abundance within fires. And he's sort of been a champion of uh, high severity fire as an important habitat for birds. And so one of his papers produced a figure like this, where each of those little square uh, boxes within each of these two panels show a couple different things. They show on the vertical axis of each box, you have different fire severities with lower severity at the bottom and higher severity at the top. And then across the horizontal axis, you have time. Okay? So there's a group of species like uh, up at the top left, house wren and bluebirds and black-backed woodpecker and western wood peewee that are clearly highly associated with fire. So for those colors, the dark red colors basically just mean that um, they have a much higher probability of occurring in those locations. And it's the opposite for the dark blue ones at the bottom right, like golden crowned kinglet and Swainson's thrush and some of those other um, mature forest birds are much less likely to be uh, to occur in post-fire habitats. And then within each of these panels, you can see some interesting patterns like um, for mountain bluebird in the, the top right portion of the left panel, they're much more likely to occur in higher severity than they are in lower severity, right? Those, those red colors kind of uh, get a little brighter. There's other species like um, red-breasted nuthatch kind of in the right side of that the upper part of the right panel, where they're much less likely to occur in high severity across a wide path of time, but in lower severity, they're, they're actually fairly common. So there's these interesting sort of mixes of time and severity that indicate that you know, there's a potential mechanism here for um, what parts of fire, what features of fire are providing habitat for different species. And Libby, you can go to the next slide. And so we tried to, you know, we, we tried to explore the same idea with maybe a little bit more um, detail. And we use the same approach. Uh, these figures are essentially the same thing as those boxes from the previous figure, except they're three-dimensional, these wireframe plots. And you can see that different species have very different and um, sometimes very particular responses to a combination of burn severity and time. So our time axis, I believe is 15 years. I think it's 15 years. And for something like black-backed woodpecker on the top left, you'll see that they're really, really much more likely to occur 
or actually this one's density. So they're much more abundant in locations where there was high burn severity and short time since fire. So these, these are fire colonizers, kind of the poster child for high severity fire as a, as a you know, creator of important habitat for wildlife. And they've been used as an indicator for such habitats. Other species have different patterns here, like in the top right, all of a sudden flycatcher, they, they seem to be responding to um, a, a more uh, moderate value for time since fire. So they become most abundant at something like 10 to 13 years or so. And they also have uh, sort of a modal response to burn severity, so a moderate burn severity. We did this for essentially the whole community or as many species as we could fit models for. I think it was around 45 species or so. Maybe you can go to the next slide. And what we did was we took the peak of each of these, each of those little wireframes, like the spot where you got the maximum value. Okay. And again, we have um, like the bottom of those wire wireframes, those bottom bottom of those um, three-dimensional plots. We had time on one axis and burn severity on the other. Here it's the same, it's time on the horizontal axis, burn severity on the vertical one. And wherever each species reached its maximum point, we put a dot on this figure. Okay, and there's a few other things going on here too. The species where we did a comparison between burned areas and unburned areas, if, if each species um, had significantly higher abundance, in burned areas, we shaded those ones red. If they had significantly higher abundance in unburned areas, we shaded them green, okay? And then all the ones that were not significant are gray. And you can see that the birds that have significantly higher abundance in burned areas um, are kind of spread out all the way across time. They're spread out a, across a, a pretty wide portion of the burn severity axis as well. So this sort of shows you how a, the bird community, I don't know what the word is, partitions itself or something across these, these features of fire. And what else is interesting from this is that the total number of species out of all these species that occur in either unburned forest or, um, excuse me, or have no significant difference or occur at highest abundance in burned forest are real roughly equal. There's about a third of the community that occurs, that has maximum abundance, highest abundance in burned forest, about a third in unburned, and then about a third are, there's no significant difference between those two. And I find that really interesting. I think what that points to is that only one third-ish of the total bird community is is really adapted and dependent on unburned forest. The other two thirds of the community is either adapted to fire in the, in the sense that there's no difference between abundance in burned locations from unburned locations. And then a third of them reach much uh, significantly higher abundance in the burned locations. So that kind of gives you an idea of Sierra Nevada biodiversity. If birds are a good indicator and we think they are, the Sierra Nevada biodiversity is really, really highly um, dependent and adapted to fire, right? There's other ways to do this. Uh, Libby, you can go ahead to the next slide. There's other ways to explore these fire effects. We've been talking about time and severity, but what about space? What, what about the difference in pattern of fire across space and what effect does that have on uh, biodiversity? And so um, Morgan Tingley, who used to work for IBP here nearby, Institute for Bird Populations, uh, I think he's now at UCLA. Um, he and colleagues have a paper from a while back that um, explored this pyrodiversity idea in, in detail. And pyrodiversity is just essentially the, the variation in fire severity across space. And they were able to show with pretty good uh, confidence that there definitely is a positive interaction between uh, the diversity, the spatial diversity of fire severity and species richness. Okay, so that, uh, that blue line after 10 years, for example, in, in this pattern becomes stronger over time. Uh, after 10 years following a fire, you have significantly higher species richness 
per location in, lo in places where there was a higher um, variety, higher variance in burn severity, right? And so we, uh, Libby, you can go ahead to the next slide. We tried to explore this idea from a, a slightly different aspect. And this was done with our colleague, Zach Steele, who's in Berkeley now, I believe. And he did this as part of his um, doctoral dissertation research at UC Davis. We took it, we took, we did this analysis from the standpoint of um, within patches of high severity fire. And this is a, an important uh, feature of recent fires is that they, they tend to have more and more of the total fire footprint burning at high severity, just because of the, the nature of how overstocked and over dense a lot of the forest is. So when fires occur, they tend to be more high severity than they used to be. And we wanted to know what was the mechanism for, um, for how this works for different species. And so we, we approached it from the standpoint of looking at the high severity patches in particular. And you can see the, that bottom um, sort of inset panel, um, figure C shows a zoomed in view of some high severity patches in dark purplish color. Um, with the, the black boundaries. <clears throat> and for each of those white points, those are bird survey locations, we, we calculated the distance to an edge. So the distance to a, a patch of lower severity or unburned forest. And we use that as a, as a metric to um, fit some bird abundant um, occupancy models. This one's not abundance, this was uh, presence absence type occupancy analysis. We found that there, there definitely is um, a measurable effect of the distance from the edge of a, um, from the inside of a high severity patch to the edge of some other severity or unburned forest. And the, the mechanism for this is, is likely to be something along the lines of it, um, the patterns for plants. Trees, when they dis disperse seeds, there's a limited distance that seed dispersal can, can go for a lot of species. Uh, other animals may experience similar restrictions to uh, nesting locations or other ecological processes that lead to them having lower abundance within these patches. And so we found for birds, there was a, a definite measurable lower richness in these really large high severity patches. And we, we, we recognize that there were, there are essentially two ways to describe this. You can either just consider each patch independently and how big is the patch. We found uh, an effect there on the right side, the, the purple and orange kind of colors. But the effect was stronger when we calculated it by distance from the point to the edge okay, in the sort of blue, gray, and yellow colors. Uh, Libby, you can go to the next slide. And this is for all species. So total richness was lower. We wanted to dive in a little bit more than just looking at all the bird species. And we found that the pattern is, is really being driven by tree nesting species and cavity nesting species, right? Those three panels at the top, you can see that the, the higher distance bands, those yellow curves, are uh, below the, the blue and the gray ones, which are the shorter distance ones, right? But for ground nesters and shrub nesters, there's not as strong of a signal. <clears throat> and this makes sense. I think the, the interior of these patches, uh, those, those locations are much less likely to be near existing standing trees from the edge of the patches. So even for species like, um, you know, cavity nesters, it seems obvious, right? They have to have a source, a nest location, nest resource. And in the inside of these patches, perhaps more of those resources have, have been burned and disappeared than near the edges. Okay, um, go ahead to the next screen, Libby. Next slide, I mean. So we're starting to break down all these mechanisms for how fires affect birds and other wildlife. And we're finding some interesting patterns. Another one that I wanted to highlight was that given that um, 
drought and the, the beetle mortality can do some of the same things that fire does, which is kill trees, uh, that, that maybe question whether the species that respond to both of those processes, fire versus beetle mortality, are going to be similar or not. And again, um, you guys probably, I, I hope you know some of the story that, that when the drought occurred back in 2013 through 2016, um, large pine trees just did not have enough water to defend themselves against these beetles. And, and the beetle outbreaks killed wide swaths of, uh, of these ponderosa pine forests, especially. And that's shown in that, on the left side there. And the, the red and yellow areas are where the, most, the largest densities of dead trees occurred. Okay, so Libby, you can go to the next slide. And um, I didn't have a great way to assemble all these data in a, in a catchy figure. So what I did was I took tables from, from two different studies. The first one was uh, the first set of results I was showing that was comparing mechanical forest treatment and fire and their effects on uh, different species. And the second one is, is a study that we published in 2019 that looked at the effects of tree mortality and other drought um, indices on, on birds. And so if the same species respond to dead trees in similar ways between beetle mortality and fire, then we would, we would expect there to be some alignment in, in these responses. So it took the you know, tables from each paper, lined them up where, where the species were similar. I think we ended up here with like 45 species or so. And I apologize for the ugliness of this table. I hate showing tables in uh, presentations like this, but I didn't have a better way to do it with my limited time. So just focus on um, the, the left side of the table in those, those more colored in mortality values. Uh, there's only four species that responded positively to uh, beetle mortality. So where their, their actual uh, abundance on our survey locations increased in places where there was more beetle mortality. There were many more species that went the opposite direction, that declined in abundance where there was more beetle mortality. And so if you remember those categories from those, those previous figures, MHSF is moderate and high severity fire and LSF is low severity fire. Um, man, the gray ones, um, I think I had that as MT previously, the mechanical treatments, fuels treatments. And then the green ones are undisturbed, undisturbed dense forest, undisturbed open forest, undisturbed shrub. And you can see there's not much alignment of those colors, right? There's of the four species that responded positively to mortality, only one of them was a modern high severity fire um, associated species. And that was hairy woodpecker. We sort of we sort of assumed that woodpeckers would be um, would benefit from beetle mortality because they they could provide nesting and foraging opportunities. Um, in the end, when we analyzed these data, we didn't find that much of a, a signal essentially for, our, for woodpeckers with mortality. And that's, I think, because we had a relatively short time span. So the number of years we had following the beetle mortality just didn't give the trees enough time. Like they, they all still had their needles, all the branches hadn't fallen off yet. So structurally, these trees kind of looked like live trees, even though they were actually dead. So it might just be that we didn't have enough time to really truly measure this mortality effect. But still, there's, there's just not much alignment between the species that respond to these different disturbances, right? Um, on the right part of that table, um, these are all, those are all the species that responded that didn't have a significant response, non-significant response to beetle mortality. Um, you can see there's a quite a large proportion or a, a slight majority at least of the total community just didn't really respond very significantly. A lot of those tend to be moderate and high severity associated species, which, you know, we're going to have to dive into this question a little more, um, a little more deeply to, to figure out what the association between these, these results is. It's possible that the species that are associated with moderate and high severity fire are just sort of more adaptable to changes and disturbances. Right? Maybe there's some effect that's common across all these species in that they are just um, 
ecologically a little bit more um, adaptable. Hard to say for sure though. Um, but the point here is that so far we find no, no close association between fire adapted species and species that, that respond to um, other types of tree mortality. Okay, Libby, you can go to the next slide. So those five topics were, um, were some of the ways that we've, we've been diving into how birds respond to fire. We also, I also wanna point out a couple of things. How do birds respond to post-fire management? So changes to fires after they occur. And this is a study we're working on right now. And um, in the interest of time here, I'm gonna to try to go through this kind of quickly. Um, if you have other questions about these, these analyses or results, I'm more than happy to talk about them. But the basic point is that with salvage logging, which is going into a fire after the fires occurred and cutting down some of the dead trees, the snags, and then using those um, for economic value, selling the timber essentially, uh, has a negative effect on many more species than it has a positive effect on. And we tried uh, several different ways to combine the, the different number of uh, locations that were salvaged. We explored these scenarios of, of what if we salvage very intens intensively at a small number of locations? What if we leave a lot of um, uh, snags behind, salvage with low intensity, just taking a few snags off of the off of the, uh, the plots, but treat a larger number of locations. Um, and we tried several different combinations of those two different things. And we could not find any situations that, that completely eliminated, eliminated the negative effects of salvage. So basically, um, our conclusion is that most efforts to go into post-fire habitat and remove snags or just disturb the post-fire habitats don't have positive effects. Some have very negative effects depending on how intensely the salvage is done. Um, and I think we can, we can draw some, some management conclusions about that. We're in locations where it's not necessary to produce uh, an economic return following a fire. Maybe it's just better to leave them alone because um, they have benefits for biodiversity. Um, okay, Libby, you can go to the next slide. In a similar sense, I wanted to show what, ha what is the um, implication of managing before fire occurs. So what happens when you manage undisturbed forest? And here again, we find the disturbances do not have largely negative effects on overall uh, biodiversity. So this is uh, the left panel is from a, a study that we contributed to by Scott, Scott Stevens published in 2014. Um, and this basically just shows that pre-treatment, those, those black uh, circles compared to post-treatment, there's not much difference in, in terms of overall diversity between a reference area that didn't, it was basically a landscape that didn't get any fuels treatments compared to um, the untreated and treated portions of a comparison landscape that did receive treatments. And in fact, there was a, possibly you know, larger increase in diversity following treatment at some of these locations. So it really appears that uh, managing undisturbed forest has few overall negative effects on the bird community, right? And again, you can look at uh, one of these first figures that I, sh I showed from that uh, recent uh, fire mechanical forest management treatments paper that um, comparing the undisturbed dense forest and undisturbed open forest, those two little, um, those two little uh, yellow and blue um, spots that are plotted on the bottom left of that uh, year since disturbance figure, uh, the blue squares are mechanical treatments. And you can see there's an immediate increase in diversity following the treatments and that increase in diversity keeps, keeps going over time. That result is kind of interesting. It's always um, in, in essentially every year after the disturbances occur, it's lower in diversity than fire. So that's interesting as well. But still, um, the, the conclusion from this, I think, is that the bird community, 
and by extension, biodiversity in the Sierra Nevada is adapted, right? Maybe you can go to the last slide. I think I have some conclusions here. So, so what does that mean for, um, for the future? I think one thing is that we should start focusing a little more on uh, fuels treatments, preparing forests to burn using prescribed fire whenever possible. So that when wildfires do come through, they don't necessarily create these large, very high severity patches. So the one feature that we were able to find that has possible negative effects overall on the bird community is these very large patches of high severity don't appear to have any benefits, right? So if we can promote a healthy mosaic, small high severity patches mixed in with moderate low severity, I think that's the best outcome. And it's just not possible for us to consider um, actively man managing these forests by thinning our way out of this overabundance of the undisturbed dense forest. We just have, we do not have the ca capacity to treat enough areas to make that feasible, a feasible approach. So we have to use all the tools in the toolbox. The most important of those is wildfire. And then I'll end with this idea that we're, we're basically living in a, with a baseline that's already shifted. Like we're, we're, we're used to looking at the forests in Sierra Nevada and probably other parts of the Western United States where there's dense trees. It looks at first glance like healthy, vibrant forest. In reality, healthy is probably not the best word for it. In reality, those overstocked, over dense forests are unhealthy. They are primed for fire in, in a situation that we don't really want. That's not on our terms. It can get out of control. It can create too much high severity. It can, have, it can um, put people and property in danger. And so if we can move forward by returning to normal in the sense that we restore fire as a process, as a, um, an integral part of ecology in Sierra Nevada, um, for the next hundred years or so, I think we're gonna be a lot better off. With that, I will uh, conclude this. I would love to answer some questions if there are some. Um, again, apologies for trying to bust through all these sort of complicated figures and so on. I'm sure I missed explaining some axes and you know, if, if there's particular questions I can try to um, lucid it with a little bit more information, I'm happy to do so. Thanks, Chelsea. Awesome. Thank you so much, Jay. No, I think you did a great job of walking us through all those figures. Um, it's really cool work that you all are doing in the Sierra Group. Um, and it I, obviously has some important implications. Um, and it was really nice to see how you tie sort of tie all of your questions together. Um, so we probably have some time for um, maybe a question or two. I have one here in the um, chat box that I will just uh, kick us off with and then um, and then we can go from there. Um, so Randy Hanvelt um, says, um, post fire, every dead tree will become a hazard tree with time. We need to balance biodiversity and habitat um, against the other values such as water, recreation, air quality now and in the future, avoiding future wildland fire as opposed to prescription, prescribed fire and economic value of logging. Um, all logging is not bad. So we are really interested in an age diverse, species diverse, drought resistant and fire resilient forest. And, um, uh, and Randy is interested in your comment to that statement. 100% agree. Um, I, have, I, I, I didn't notice anything in there that I would disagree with. In, in fact, the, the logging aspect of this, I think is particularly interesting. I would, you know, I mean, when people ask me, I generally say, we could use a lot more logging. And especially if, if the trade-offs are things like, should we be doing salvage logging after fires to produce economic value versus logging in um, over, over dense unburned forest? I would say it's way more useful and has, has better economic value, better ecological value to do that logging in the unburned forest. And so part of this is, you know, it's a legacy of um, going too far in one direction decades ago, too many clear cuts, um, you know, endangering habitat for spotted owls and other uh, mature forest species. 
And we've kind of, you know, had a bit of a pendulum swing in the, the opposite direction a little bit too far, perhaps, like an analogy of the situation. But yeah, essentially, the way you describe that, I, I'm fully, fully back that entire statement. Great. Thanks, Jay. Um, I have I have one question and I think we can wrap it up. Um, so uh, I, I'm wondering, how are you all translating what you're learning to inform action, either from a management or a policies perspective? And I'm wondering if you can give an example or two. It's a, it's a tough nut to crack. Um, an example would be that the um, all the all of the national forests in the Sierra Nevada are undergoing, they're in some part of a process of uh, updating management plans. And so when we have the opportunity, we have joined some of those planning meetings. We've offered some of the results from, from things we've found, um, whether it's in regards to salvage logging or post-fire habitat management or what the effect of um, uh, on biodiversity is of, of uh, suppressing fires and so on. Uh, we take those opportunities to provide comments. When, when they publish drafts of these um, management plans, we, we try to respond to those drafts by suggesting um, things, that, things in there that don't um, align with what we, we have been learning. Like that's, that's the basic idea, but the process is extremely time intensive. It's really complicated because you have to get all interested parties into the same location to sort of discuss. And so um, you can end up with situations where the minority view is the loudest. And so it tends to get a little bit more um, attention than majority views of, of you know, potentially less, um, uh, less vocal um, contrib contributors and so on. So it's a, re it's a really, um, it's a really difficult, complex human, human decision-making process that takes a long time. The pro one of the biggest problems with this is that conditions change. So the Sierra, Nevada, Sierra National Forest is one of these forests that has just updated their plan and they were in the process of finalizing it. And then the Creek Fire happened. And the Creek Fire burned, I forget how much, 200,000 or something acres, a huge fire, like a huge portion of the Sierra, Nevada, Sierra National Forest burned. So the conditions that they based their plan on have changed. <laughs> and now they have to basically restart, not maybe not restart, but they have to revamp the process to reflect those change conditions. And so when we have an opportunity, we'll be presenting our findings, you know, in, in whichever format we think that they can, they can use and assimilate and, and help to drive policy decisions like that. Great, thank you. Um, so that I think is all the time we have for questions. There are some lingering in the chat box that we won't be able to get to if folks wanna reach out to me. Um, I'm happy to sort of um, uh, convey them to Jay or, um, uh, and, and otherwise, we'll look forward to um, seeing everybody next week. And I just want to say, Jay, um, thank you so much for taking uh, time to share your expertise and, um, and experience with the group. Uh, it's, it's, it's a great reminder of all the awesome work that we're doing within the organization um, to influence fire-related policy and management. So, um, so thank you so much. Yeah, um, thank you. Yeah, Appreciate absolutely. It. And we will see everybody uh, next week uh, with Dr. Erin Conlis uh, presenting uh, to us on some work that she's doing um, with fires in Southern California shrublands. And so um, uh, until next time, thanks everyone. Thanks Jay. And thanks Libby for driving the slides. Yeah. Thank you, Libby. Okay. Bye everyone. Take care.